fun. Welcome everybody to your free GMAT prep hour. It is November 21st, 2021. I will be your host tonight through the wonderful world of the GMAT. My name is Reed Arnold, broadcasting from Oklahoma City. Usually I'm in New York, but I'm back home for the holidays visiting my family. So I am up in their study. Um, if you're looking for other free GMAT study resources, we got them. You can try our first class, either online or in person, for those of you that are in New York City and other cities around the country. We're starting to try some in-person classes again. You can try the first class for free. Uh, that is one-ninth of the entire course, over 10% that you can just try free of charge. Like I always say, we talk about huge, huge stuff in class one. We talk about you know how the test is scored and how uh, what study tactics you need. We talk about data sufficiency, dive into several big strategies you need for that question type. And we talk about sentence correction. It's a good overview of how to move through that question type. So uh, it's a big resource that you got free of charge. Um, even if you don't plan on signing up for the course, I would recommend taking class one because why not uh, get, cover some of the major things you need as you uh, kick off your GMAT studies. Um, you can also do the same with our Interact course. That is our video course. You can try out a few classes of that for free. Get a sense if you like that or not. Really nifty program uh, kind of adapts to you as you're going through the class. You get questions right. It says, great, let's do a harder question. If you get questions wrong, it says, okay, let's look at this closer. Let's dig into the fundamentals. So it's a little bit more interactive, hence the name Interact, than your typical video course. But it's a really handy, really nifty way to study for those of you that are looking for the self-paced option. Also, uh, as of this year, we have started to offer our Foundations of Math course for free. Uh, that happens once or twice a month. It's a seven-hour workshop done either in one day or split over two days. Um, goes over the foundation, foundations of quant, the most basic concepts the test uses. But the thing that's really nifty about it is we talk about those concepts in a GMAT way. And so I, you know, first took that course having taught the GMAT already for several years, and I got something out of that course. So I think even if you, uh, even if you are more advanced, I think there's reasons to take that Foundations of Math course. I think there's a lot of tips and tricks there that anyone could benefit from. So uh, those are free. And if you can't make the day that the course is actually scheduled, you can get the video version of the course for free as well. So that is a free resource for everyone to have. So, uh, but today, in this free GMAT prep hour, we are talking about the scoring algorithm of the test. We're going to do a deep dive into how the GMAT is scored, get you a sense of what's actually going on as far as we know, right? There's kind of a big black box in the algorithm world. Uh, it's proprietary information, so we, we don't know everything. We don't know the exact math, but we have a good sense of what's going on with the GMAT algorithm and how it's scored. Um, if you are a GMAT studier and you are using these free GMAT prep hours, by the way, if you would like to watch other recordings, we have a whole library of them on our YouTube channel. But I mentioned this last time at the end of the session, I feel like we've covered a lot. I feel like a lot of the big stuff's out there. Um, there's a few things we need to do. We need to do maybe some geometry like rectangles, triangles stuff. Um, you know, they're like little topics that we could do, but like when it comes to major things, the things you really need to get a good score, I honestly think it's all out there. So at this point, I'm looking for topics. So if you have, if you have anything, any little topic that you want to see a free GMAT prep hour for that we have not done, email me at rarnoldandmanhattanprep.com. Let me know, you know, what you would like to see, because I've, I've said a lot of what I want to say. Um, and so if you have a topic, shoot it my way. And if it's, I think, a, vi a viable topic, a good topic that needs to, that we could touch on, I'll, you know, dev design a lesson around it, okay? Um, so just shoot me an email there. But today we're talking about the algorithm, how this test is scored, okay? So this might, this is going to start, we're going to start with kind of like the foundations. If you've been studying for the test, you might know some of this, but I promise you by the end of it, you're going to learn some stuff that you didn't know, maybe that you don't need to know, but you're really gonna have a good sense of how the GMAT scoring algorithm works by the time this day is over. First off, the GMAT comes in four sections. Uh, there's the essay, which is graded from zero to six. There is the integrated reasoning section, which is graded from one to eight. Those scores are separate from the scores we're talking about today, the quant and the verbal section. These are the two uh, sections from which the overall score, that 200 to 800 point score that you, know and love or will come to know and love as you study for this test, uh, those come only from the quant and verbal section. Okay, And in the quant section, you get a score from 6 to 51. And in the verbal section, you get a score from 6 to 51. Except that's kind of a lie. Uh, 51 is very hard to get in the verbal. It's really maxing out at about a 45. It's technically 
possible to get above a 45, but very, very rare. So for most purposes, we consider 45 the highest score in the verbal. And the, you know, the quant and the verbal score, it, the same numbers, uh, but they mean different things. They're, it's just, it's, it's not the same score. If I get a quant 48, verbal 48, well, for one, that's much stronger in the verbal because a 48 verbal is outrageous. But um, if they're the same, you know, if I get a quant 30 and a verbal 30, that's actually a stronger quant score. The way to compare your quant and your verbal is to subtract six from the quant score, and that gives you a comparable verbal score. Okay, so don't, you know, don't just directly compare the numbers to determine which one is stronger. And also don't look at the percentiles, ignore the percentiles. Okay, uh, the quant percentile is gonna look deflated because there's just a lot of students get really high quant scores, you know, and it's, it's business schools don't need you to get that perfect 50, but 12% of people get a 50 or a 51. There's just a lot, and I've never gotten a 50 on an official test, you know, and I've taught this for a while. Um, and so it just, just know that 45 or above is a very strong quant score, but percentile wise, it's gonna look sometimes, you know, average or something. So don't worry about the quant, the sectional percentiles. They really are skewed. And I don't even look at them when students take a test. I just look at the scaled score. I subtract six from the quant. I use that to compare to the verbal. Okay. Uh, and that quant and verbal score are the ones that determine your overall score from 200 to 800. And honestly, it's just an addition game. They add it up and that addition, that sum typically max, uh, maps to a score, right? So if I get a 4741, that adds up to an 88. That's about a 720. It might be a little less. It might be a little more. It could be a 730. It could be a 710, but it's probably going to be a 720. Okay. If I get a oh, quant 44 and a verbal 35, that adds up to a 79. So a 79 is about a 650. Could be a 640. Could be a 660. Probably going to be a 650. So every point on the scaled score verbal and every point on the scaled score in quant is worth the same. Uh, it's there's there's no point in verbal that's worth more than a point in quant. It's just literally added up. That's going to map to a score from 200 to 800. Why did they choose 200 to 800? Why did they choose six to 51? I I don't know. I don't know, I've always wondered why standardized tests use the numbers they use, but these are the numbers they use, okay? So it's literally just an addition from your quant and your verbal section, okay? Um, we are talking, uh, I have a question in the chat about integrated reasoning scores. We are talking about the quant and the verbal scoring algorithm today. Uh, and it's a question about leaving questions blank in the IR versus the, the um, quant and verbal sections. The IR, I actually, I don't think a blank hurts as much. And I'm, I sh should know the answer to that. I don't believe a blank answer. And, and in fact, we'll talk about how a blank answer hurts in uh, the quant and the verbal section. The thing about a blank in the quant and the verbal is that it counts as wrong. It counts as a wrong answer. Um, but if you have multiple blanks in a row, that'll hurt you and we'll explain why. I think leaving a few IR questions blank is probably not as is, is probably not a big deal because IR is graded a different way, and it's you can get a perfect IR score and you know miss two or three of the questions, maybe even four, and still get a perfect eight. So it's just a, it's a different ball game. Okay, so these are the numbers of the test, but the thing that we really want to get we want to understand today is where those numbers come from because this test is graded very differently from the way any other test you've taken has been graded so here's the old way a test might be graded i want you to just look at these we have a question number there are 30 questions on this test here's samantha's test and tells you if she got a question right or wrong and here's karthik's uh right or wrong column and so i want you to just you know who gets the higher score samantha or karthik I don't actually need you to finish that question. I just, I figure I know what you did, right? You probably started counting up how many wrong answers there were. And if you did that, I don't, I don't, there's no reason to actually make you do that. If you do that, you're going to find that Samantha went 20 for 30. She missed 10 questions and Karthik went 19 for 30. He missed 11 questions. And so in the old ways of scoring a test, Samantha wins. She got more questions, right? She gets the higher score. Okay. Karthik missed one more question. So Karthik gets the lower score. Okay. 
that's how tests have been graded all your life up till now. It's how the SAT is graded. That's how the ACT graded. That's how the LSAT is graded. You know, the stand, this usual way of, of grading tests is who gets more questions right. That person gets the higher score. The GMAT is different. Very, 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 very different. And that's what I really want people to take away from this and to understand how that difference can be used to their advantage. First off, you might know that this test adapts to you. Okay, and we'll talk about what that means a lot today. But for now, the, you know, you can think of it, it's not quite this simple, but you can think of it as if you get a question right, you get a harder question. If you get a question wrong, you get an easier question. That's a simplified idea. That's not quite how it works, but it's close enough. Okay, so here are two students taking a section and student one gets some right answers and then ends up at this, you know, the hardest questions that the test offers. Student two, you might realize, never really gets above this level. Okay. And so the question is, who, who do you, you think should get the higher score? Let's not worry about what the GMAT thinks. Who deserves the higher score here? Student one, student two, or maybe it should be a tie. Let's just pull the room. In an adaptive test where student one got to these hard questions and then fell off at the end and student two never got to those hard questions, who deserves the win, student one or student two? Or call it a tie. vote for one, a vote for two. Any other votes? A vote for one, okay. Vote for one. So we have some vote for two. It's evenly split. One has a few more votes right now, it's, uh, about three to two. Uh, four to two. So let me rephrase the question. Let me ask a different question. Let's pretend instead of this being a, you know, the difficulty of a question, what if this is the value of a stock portfolio? And student one, student two, your asset managers. Do you want to be a student one now or do you want to be a student two? All of a sudden the answer is very clear. I want to be a student two. I don't want to be a student one. Student one, you know, yeah, had some highs, went all in on GameStop and that was a fun day, but then <laughs> didn't last. Things started to plummet made some bad decisions, ended up at, you know, and now I have less money than student two does. Student two wins. And that's how you want to think about, that's one way to think about this algorithm, is you want to think about each question as a chance to invest. And the fact is, is that these difficult investments, they don't, you know, getting those questions, the reward from those questions, isn't as rewarding as the punishment is for missing these questions. Missing easier questions is quite punitive. Okay. It, you're, the floor of your, the ceiling of your score can be thought of as determined by the easier questions you miss. And so student one likely ran out of time, you know, was spending a lot of time on these harder questions, got some of them right. That's great, good for them, but then plummeted because they ran out of time and maybe some focus. And um, yeah, you want, I mean, you can think of this as an allocation of resources. Your resources are your time, your energy, and your knowledge. Well, if you expunge these two resources on these difficult investments, now you're out of resources for these easy investments and you're missing the free money. Okay. And so that's, I mean, this is a very crash, crash course introduction to how the GMAT is graded, right? It's not so much about the number of questions you get, right? It's about this adaption over time to the difficulty level that you're getting right or wrong. And yeah, student two didn't see all those really hard questions, but student two also didn't miss that many of these really easy questions and, you know, didn't miss several in a row that tank their trajectory. And so ends up at a higher place and gets a higher score. Where you end is what you get. Okay. So here's two different students, different student one and student two. Student one on this section got a 43. Student two on this section got a 32. If the green is their ability level, though, I'm actually pretty psyched for both of these students because they got the score they should get. They got the score at their ability level. Here's just a rough truth that you have to understand every time you sit down to take the test. There's a score you're not supposed to beat. There's a ceiling you're not supposed to get higher than. You might be able to swing a point due to some luck, but, you know, it's pretty much impossible to do better than you can do but it's a lot easier it's very easy to do worse than you can do 
you want to hit your ceiling and kind of live there as long as you can, just till the end of the test. In between tests, you can lift that ceiling. I want to be clear. I'm not saying that this is a fixed point forever, but the day you take the test, you just have to understand there's a score I'm not supposed to beat. There's a ceiling I'm not going to beat. I'm just going to hit my ceiling and live there. And if a question is too hard, you know, I'm going to bail on it. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. If this question is too hard, I'm going to bail on it. You know, it doesn't matter if it's hard overall. It just matters if it's hard to you. This question is too hard for this test taker today. They shouldn't spend four minutes on it, five minutes on it, trying to get it. Because then, you know, if they do that, if a student overinvests in these questions, they do something like this. They, Icarus, they fly too close to the sun. Their wings melt and they crash. Okay. Generally, so, so I have a question about timing. You know, the, the rough average for quant, it is an average, right? It's two minute average. My advice is usually 230 plus means you get it right. You need to know you're going to get it right and not know that you could get it right or that you're smart and you're capable of getting this question right. You need to know that you're going to get this question right in 30 seconds. Okay, and then above 315 is just not even worth it. So you can go long on a question sometimes. It's just you have to be, feel confident you're going to get the thing. But notice what's happening in this, in this uh, section. Both students miss about half the questions. The number correct is not the thing that gets student one the higher score. They miss similar numbers of questions. Student one's questions had a more difficult basket overall. Okay. This question here is relatively easy for student one. It's pretty hard for student two. So student one got it and stayed higher. But you're going to miss, uh, the algorithm is pretty good about making sure that everyone misses about the same number of questions. That's not what determines the score. And the other thing to know is that this test always feels difficult. If you're hoping to like study and, you know, learn some stuff and then go in and, and take the test and it's going to feel great because you studied a lot and it's not going to be hard and you're just going to breeze through it and kick its butt and you're going to leave with a great score. That's not how it's going to work. It's going to still kick the crap out of you. That's just how the test is. You kind of learn to laugh about it and just kind of, you know, be a masochist. Just know that it's going to throw these questions, no matter how good you get, it's going to throw that question. that's like way too hard for you. And you just got to be like, no, not going to do that today and skip it and move on. And you have to be comfortable with that because the test, as, we ta as we'll talk about with this algorithm, the test has to give you questions that are too hard for you in order to determine your score. That's what it's trying to do. There's no perfection on this thing. There's no reason to expect it or go for it. And that's the nice thing about this algorithm. You are free from the burden of perfection. That the way old tests are graded where every question matters and you, you know, whoever gets the most questions right wins. That's not how this works. You shouldn't expect that. You shouldn't try to get all these questions right. Okay. I have a question, my head tends to heat up, maybe I assume just like heat up, meaning it's like I get frazzled halfway through a section. Yeah, that happens. That happens all the time. You're, you're rattled, the question pops up, that's like tangles you in knots, you get frustrated. You can watch me take a test, everybody. One of the free GMAT prep hours, I take a test and you can watch me, the verbal and the quant, you can watch me get confused and have to skip and it's always how it works. Test always is gonna feel hard, okay? So what really, you know, what really keeps a person from getting the score that they're capable of is often missing questions they shouldn't miss. If this is your score you should get, if you're at a, you know, you're capable of getting a 41, but you miss a few questions you shouldn't miss, and then you miss a few more, and then you keep missing a few more, you're going to end up 10 points lower than you should, five, 10 points lower than you ought to. Okay. I'm not saying you have to be perfect even there. You can make a few mistakes and recover. Uh, the algorithm will account for that. But if you do it too many times, yeah, your score suffers.
the test is going to judge your ability level to be lower than it actually is. You can do harder questions than the test has given you, but you made some silly mistakes. Now, of course, one of the things being tested is how, how often do you make silly mistakes? So, you know, if you, if you make too many silly mistakes and you don't correct the habits, it's just going to stay, your, your ability level is not going to change. Your overall score, anyway, is not going to change. You, you could theoretically do harder questions, but your habits are keeping you down. Figure out how to clean up those silly, mess, those, those silly misses, those silly mistakes, and get your score up several points just by not missing easier questions. A lot of students want to focus on the hard stuff. They want to, you know, get to the combinatorics and probability. No, if you're not scoring above a 45, you don't need to worry about the hard stuff. A 45, which is a really good quant score, at least um, for verbal, it's about a 38. But if a 45 for quant, you can get that without doing that well on the 700 level questions. You just have to master the easy and the intermediate. And you can get a 45. And uh, missing several questions in a row at the end is also very punitive. And here's why. What's happening when you miss, when you, I'm sorry, not missing several in a row, skipping, not answering. Okay, not answering questions in a row is especially punitive. Because what happens when you don't finish is the test, the algorithm starts it gives you the questions that it would have given you if you had missed each question. So if this is question, what would this be about 25, 26, I think. If you, if you run out of time on that question, the test says you missed it. And then it gives you, it, it gives you what it would have given, or it, it gives your test what it would have given you a question 27 that's a little bit easier. But you miss, you miss that because the test just counts it wrong. And so it determines what question it would have given you for 28. And you miss that because you you're out of time. Then it determines what it would give you for 29. And you miss that. And 30. So you miss that. And 31. So you miss that. And I add an extra question. But you get the point. It counts all these questions as wrong. And it just sends you into a downward spiral. Whereas if you had time to guess on some of these, you know, there's a 20% chance you guess right. And a, a right answer can save the spiral, right? So you can, you know, instead of plummeting down, you can get up here. And then, yeah, you might not, you might not get all the rest, but at least you stop the bleeding. And if you get too right, you really stop the bleeding. You know, you can really stop a downward spiral by just a few right answers here that you would have otherwise missed. Okay. So you don't want to leave questions blank at the end because the test just starts spitting them out as wrong answers and you don't have a chance to correct it. And so it just keeps giving you easier and easier questions. You keep missing them because you're out of time and that can hit you, you know, two to four points. If it's enough questions, I mean, if it's enough questions, it can be a, you know, huge hit. So this, the way this test is graded is very different from the paper test you're used to. In the paper test, you're looking for the most right answers you can get. And the strategy would usually be to triage a little bit, to look around and find the easy questions and do those quickly, get those out of the way, and then find the hard questions and really spend your time there and focus on those, skip them on the first pass, come back to them, spend extra time, really get those because those are going to be the differentiators often. This test is not like that. In an adaptive test like this, you're gonna see a better score doesn't get more questions right. They see a harder basket of questions at the end of the day. And that means when a question looks easy, if a question pops up and you're like, oh, this is easy, I can do this. Well, do it, slow down, get it right. Don't make a silly mistake because that's gonna kneecap you. It does two things. One, it gives you a, a miss, but two, it tells the test that you miss questions of that difficulty. And so it, the test adapts downward. And you do it too often, the test is adapted downward so much that it's just not going to adapt upward again. If a question looks hard, I'm not saying you skip it immediately, poke at it a little bit, see if you can figure anything out, but get ready to bail. Get ready to, do, to just burn it and not deal with it. And again, you're going to do that on the, you know, you're going to miss 12 questions of the 31 quant, 12 to 15. So that's a third to half. <laughs> that's a lot of questions that you can just be like, I don't need to worry about this. And that's what I'm saying. It's hugely liberating when you get to this phase where you're just like, oh, this question pops up, looks like hell. I don't want to do it. I'm skipping it. That's great. And you just know that's going to happen and you feel good about it. It's not a failure at that point. 
in verbal, you know, it's, it's about 12 as well, you know, 12 to 16 or 17. Okay. Now, so when it comes to improvement, one thing to know is that the questions that are easy for you, okay, every time you take a test, right, you're going to see some questions that are harder for you, and you're going to see some questions that are easier for you. And you're going to score, you know, they're, they're probably the score you get is going to be somewhere in the middle of that range. That's the score the test decides is your ability level. It kind of gets a sense that these questions are too hard and these questions are too easy. Okay. Your goal as you study is to move this range up. Now, what does it mean to move that range up? Well, that means not just that you, you know, get harder questions. It means that the questions that are hard for you, not only do you get them, they start to be easy. It's not just that you're getting these questions right, or, you know, you're getting more of these questions right. It's that they actually are easier for you. And these questions that were basically impossible for you are hard until eventually they are also easy. And these questions that you never even thought you would see are hard for you, but you get a few of them. You know, you have to think of the, the study this, think of your studies this way and notice like the things that are easy for you, you actually don't get to do anymore. That's what I love about this test. If you get really good at something, you actually don't even get to show it off on the test because it just knows that's too easy for, for them today. I'm not going to give them that question. You know, they stop seeing these difficulty and then you stop seeing these difficulty and then you stop seeing these difficulty. You just master out of that difficulty range, more or less. You might see one or two, but that's what improvement looks like. And so to really get a gut feeling for how this scoring algorithm works, we're going to do a, a we're going to use a metaphor, an al, a, a metaphor for the algorithm that I am uh, stealing from Kaylee Erickson, who used to teach for Manhattan Prep. Kelly, if you've watched this, I've used this many times. It's a great metaphor for this test. Really gets you kind of an intuitive feel for what's going on on the test. And I think helps drive home why wrong answers aren't really the game and lets you feel better about missing questions. Because that's one thing I want today is I want you to leave feeling better about missing questions on this test. Okay, so the metaphor for this, for the score is we're going to pretend that you're trying to figure out how far I can throw a football. But here's the game. You don't get to watch me throw the football. Instead, what you do is you can tell a, there's a computer and you can set a, a distance, a target at a certain distance for, for me to aim at. And a computer will tell you, you don't get to watch, a computer tells you if I hit the target or if I miss the target. It doesn't tell you if it was, you know, in the middle of the target or at the very edge. It doesn't tell you... You know, if, if, if I had to really struggle to do it or if it was pretty easy for me, it just tells you hit it or not. You also know that because the algorithm, because the computer is a little glitchy, 20% of the time I don't hit the target, the computer tells you I did hit the target. So, you know, if I get a question wrong or if I, I'm sorry, I shouldn't use a question. If I miss a throw, the computer actually tells you I made it. So, you know, there's a chance for false positives. That's to represent the 20, you know, it's five answer choices. You have a 20% chance just blind guessing on the test. So that's to fit that in here. Okay. So what you can do is you can set a distance. Uh, there's a target set. I throw and a computer tells you if I hit the target or not. If I don't, 20% of the time, it tells you I did. That's the rough idea. And you're trying to figure out at what distance do I go from likely to get the target to likely to miss? That's roughly what you're trying to figure out. Where do I go, you know, 51% chance of hitting to 49% chance of missing over time, you know, not, you know, over, over a full set of throws, not just once or twice, right? For over a consistent set of throws, where do I go from consistent to not consistent? So you might start at kind of an average distance throw. 25 yards. Now, by the way, just so you all know, the way I determined if I hit the target or not, I used a random number generator. And I had a yardage that I knew was, I, I chose was like my 50% mark and questions easier, yardages easier than that. I gave myself a higher chance of hitting and yardages higher than that. I gave myself a lower chance of hitting until it's basically the 20% blind guess. Okay. So I just use random number generators to generate this exercise. So 25 yards, 
said, uh, said I hit it. So let's try 35 yards, okay? Again, said I hit it. Let's try 50 yards, okay? Said I hit it. That's a long throw. So let's try 55 yards. Computer says I didn't hit it. Go back to 50 yards. Computer says I didn't hit it. Let's go to 45 yards. Computer says I didn't hit it. And this process keeps going. 40 yards, I hit it. 40 yards, I hit it. 43 yards, I didn't hit it. 42 yards, I hit it. Okay, and then let's finish out. So just take a look at these yardages and tell me, you know, what score do you think I deserve in this yardage throwing game? Where do I go from, you know, unlikely 49% chance of missing to 51% chance of getting at what yardage? Yeah, 43. That was the yardage I picked ahead of time is my ability level for this game. I gave that a 50% chance. And just a reminder, this is a metaphor. The yardage is I'm not, I'm not a computer. I, I'm not using the exact GMAT algorithm. This is just to show you how this style of algorithm determines a score. Okay. So notice that that 50 yarder right there it said I hit it. That was lucky. The random number generator said that I got a question right that was a lucky guess. It was a 20% chance and I got it. Okay. So it gave me some, a hard throw and I missed it. And it gave me another 50 and that time I missed it. And then it gave me 45 and I gave myself like a 33% chance of that and I missed it. Okay. Yeah. 43 yards consistently would be a pretty good, pretty solid quarterback. Okay. Um, so notice there were, you know, there was a lucky guess that happened early, but then the, it, it made the adaption, right? Okay, figured out that was probably a lucky guess. It gave me another 50. It gave me a 45. I missed a 43. I missed a 43. I got some 43s. I missed a 44. I missed another 44. I got a 44, but I missed a 44, and I missed a 44. So I figured that, that 50 was probably a lucky guess. And it ended up right at the ability that I chose. This is, again, a random number generator that I just uh, used after I picked the ability level. Okay, and so here's, just so you know, I'm not gonna show you this for every time we do, do this exercise, but here was what I you know, decided, and this is totally not real, it's just what I decided for the game, that this was the, you know, the um, average thrower's probability of, probability of success at a certain yardage, and what my probability of success was as someone who has an ability of 43. You know, 25 yard throw, I have a very good chance of getting that right. I gave myself 98% chance of getting that yardage right. And most people, the average person is 75%, but I had a really good chance of getting it. And I did, you know, that had a low chance of missing. 35, still a pretty good chance, 91%. Got that one, cool. 50 yards, 20%, blind guessing. Got it though, happened to get a good guess. Okay, great. Another 55, that's blind guessing, didn't get it. Uh, 50 yards, I gave myself another 20%. Missed it. So then it gave me 45. And I gave myself a little bit higher than guessing rates on 45. You know, if you throw 43, sometimes you can throw a little farther accurately. So I gave myself a little better odds, but it didn't work out. I missed that question. 40, I gave myself 67% odds. Two out of three times, I'm going to hit it. Okay, so I got it, got it. 43 was at that 50% mark. So here's that 50% mark. Missed it. 42, I gave myself 60%. Got it. And so I started to dance between 42, 43, 44, and ended up at about the 43, which makes sense. So notice a few things. The algorithm, and again, this is not the way the GMAT algorithm actually will look. It's just a style of this algorithm. Notice how at first when I didn't know, and I mean, of course, I knew because I picked the yardage, but when the algorithm didn't know how far uh, I could throw consistently, it was making pretty big jumps, 25, 35, 50, 55. 45, 40, 43, right? We were going by fives and tens and threes. But as it narrowed down towards the end, it had a pretty good sense of where I was. And it started to just move up and down one by one, 43, 42, 43, 44. Okay, it had narrowed in on where my ability level was. And I stayed consistent there. So the algorithm stayed there. Okay, let's look at a different, here's a different simulation. Okay, and I'm just, just giving you the whole thing. So take a look at this. And what do you think this person's score, or this person's ability level is?
I had this one at 20. Okay. So 25 for this person, they didn't have great odds of getting that. It might have been, I, I might have said it at 20%. I might have said that that's guessing rates. And they didn't get it. So they, they went down. Now, notice there were some lucky guesses here. There were some times where the algorithm actually, the, the random number generator gave me some lucky guesses at 23 and 25 and 25 and uh, 23. I didn't give myself great odds at 23, but it, it happened to spit out some right answers. And so I was, you know, a little bit higher than, than uh, I ended up for a while because I had some relatively lucky guesses I had a streak of good luck. But the algorithm, if you know, eventually it figured out, nope, that was lucky, missing too many, you know, missed another 23, missed a 23, missed a 23, missed a 20. Eventually the law of averages caught up to me and I brought my, you know, brought my score back down to the 20 that I picked as the 50% mark. Okay, so you can get a lucky streak and pull ahead for a while, but it's gonna pull you back down. Okay, so just consider this, compare these two people, the 43 that I did and the 20. Notice that the 43 missed 13 times, missed, you know, didn't hit the target 13 times. You can think of that as a wrong answer. The 20 missed 16 times. Now you might think, oh, well, okay, hold up. The 20 missed more questions. So that's why they got a lower score. It's just back to the old game. Well, first off, it was just three more. And for a 20 to a 43, that's a big difference for three questions missed. That's not why the score is so different. And the reason this person missed more, why did this person miss more? Well, because they got to a level they shouldn't get to. And they continued to stay there with some lucky guesses. So there were a few, you know, there were more harder questions for this person. All these 23s, all these 25s, 26s, this 30, this 27. This person had a lot harder package for them, a harder basket of questions, because they had some lucky guesses that early inflated their score. And so, yeah, they missed more, but that's not why their score is lower. Okay. They missed more because they got a little bit inflated early and that gave them more chances to miss, but that's not why their score is lower. Okay. Now take a look at this one. So the game on this one is that let's pretend that this person is doing the game. And for some reason in this stretch, the algorithm glitches. Doesn't do so well. It just keeps spitting out fifties for some reason. They keep, you know, a lot of missing at 50, but the algorithm just keeps wanting to give them 50 yards. Throw 50, throw 50, throw 50. And the, I'm throwing and I, I can't. <laughs> Every now and then, it, you know, a lucky guess. I get a lucky yes. Where would this person score, do you think? After the algorithm then corrects, it's like, oh, I've given too many 50s. What score does this person get? Okay, any guesses? 43, that's a fair guess. 45, I probably, I mean, I, I think I chose a 44, if I remember right. Yeah, so I gave the score 44. The ability I gave this person was a 43, but they happened to get a few kind of lucky answers here at the end and at 44. And so I decided this, you know, the score would probably spit it out as a 44. So they got a little lucky and a little better than 43, that, which is their ability, which happens. Sometimes you do a little better than your, uh, your, your, ability level just with a few lucky guesses that's fine it happens but the thing i really want to point out to this question uh, to this to this test taker is uh, how you know they missed 16 times including in that you know streak where they were given way too many 50s how much did these misses hurt their overall score of 44 how much does missing a 50 yard throw hurt you if you're scoring a 44 it doesn't hurt you at all. You're supposed to miss those. If you're scoring a 44, you are supposed to miss 50 yard throws. There's no reason. And you know, what if you try to throw it 50 yards and you throw your arm out? This is again, a metaphor, right? You throw your arm out and then you can't throw it 42 yards when you should be able to. 
that's the same idea as if you run out of time, you're using all your time on these harder questions and then you can't do the easier questions you're well capable of. There's no reason to worry about missing these. That's not my ability. And it doesn't affect my score at the end of the day. Missing 16 times doesn't really affect my score. Okay. It's not about the number right or wrong. That's not how your score is determined. And again, this is not the perfect simulation of the GMAT algorithm, but it's a similar style game. This was a similar situation. So same idea, right? This was, uh, I ran that, I ran these simulations a few times. Same idea, right? This person missed, they were given a lot of fifties. They shouldn't have been given for some reason. The algorithm messed up, then it corrected and it lowered down. This person ended up, yeah, 38, 39 ish. But the thing that was interesting about this that I want to point out is that if I remember right, this was bad luck. Let me see if this was bad luck. 18 misses. No, this was silly mistakes. Excuse me. So, uh, yeah, so this wasn't just bad luck. What I did here is on these questions, 40, this 42, this 40, and this 30, 38, the algorithm, I'm sorry, the random number generator said that I got this question right. I just picked these three questions randomly as I was doing this. And so uh, I determined, you know, just to simulate this, at this question, I said, if, it, if, if I get this yardage, if the random number generator says I get it, I'm going to say I missed it because of a silly mistake. It's one that I should get and I screw the pooch and mess it up. And then I did it here at the 40. I said, if, if I get this question right, I'm gonna make a silly mistake and say that I missed it. And then I did it once more. So I did it three times, same ability level as the one who got the 44 just before. And notice what that did to the score, right? Now I'm four points too low because of three silly mistakes that knocked me down into a lower score range. If I'd gotten this 40, like the random number generator said that I would, I would have stayed in the 40s. I would have gone back up to 41, got another chance at 41. I wouldn't have dropped down to 35 and 38. If I'd gotten this 38, I would have jumped up to a 39, 40 instead of have to, you know, go stay at 38. This 40 was actually not a silly mistake. That was just the odds didn't play, which happens too. You know, if you can get, a, if you can get questions at difficulty 45, you still have some chance of missing ones at 42, 43. It just doesn't happen as often, but there's still a chance. That's why you want to not make silly mistakes on the ones you should get. Right? So these silly mistakes really tanked my score. That's what hurt my score. These didn't hurt my score. All the 50 misses, miss all they want. Miss 50 of them. Who cares? The three silly mistakes kept knocking me down to questions easier than I really should be at, at the end of a section. And that's true of the test as well. You make a few silly mistakes and you're just knocked down to where you really shouldn't have to be. Okay. Here's another simulation. And this one, I didn't have this one, the algorithm didn't mess up. There's no spitting 50s at me for several times in a row. What score would you give this person? probably around a 42, 41, 42, right? But I want to point out, I think, what did I get him? So his ability was a 43. Their ability was the same as the 43s we've seen before. That's the cutoff. That should be the 50% mark. I ended up at a 42, but that's because I gave myself four silly mistakes early in the section. But notice that you have a chance to recover from this. 
right? I made a silly mistake. And again, what it meant by silly mistake was the random number generator said I should get that question right. It said, got it correct. And I just said, I just discounted that and said, nope, missed it. And I did it four times. Question one, question like four or five, question eight and question 12, whatever it was. And so, yeah, when I missed question one, I got down here in the easy questions, but I got all those and I got, you know, recovered quickly. And then I missed 35 and I shouldn't have missed it. Uh, so it went down, but then I, and I missed 37, I shouldn't have missed it. But then in the back half, I performed well, got my 37, got my 38, got my 39, got my 40, got my 43, got my 45, missed a 50 because it's 20% chance. Okay. Ended up in the low forties. So a few silly mistakes early, you can prove over time to the test. Like ah, I shouldn't have missed those. That was silly. And the algorithm will correct upwards for you. So you might wonder like, oh, well, then shouldn't I just, maybe I should just miss some early. <laughs> you know, maybe I should just give myself a few easy, intentionally miss some so that I'm getting easy questions and, you know, it's, then I can recover at the end. Well, you don't want to do that either because here's what also happened when I ran this simulation. Same silly mistakes. I, I kept the beginning here and operated after that. But what happened to this student, okay, same silly mistakes up front. same ability level, but ended up at a 39, four points lower than they should. Because at this point, after the silly mistakes that I intentionally said were wrong, then the, I just had bad luck. And it was not intentional. It was just, I gave myself 70% chance at 39 and I missed a 39 and I missed a 39. I got a few and I gave myself a 66% chance at 40, but I missed a 40 and I missed another 40 and I missed another 39. And I missed another 40. And so it was just like bad luck. Oops, you know, had pretty good odds on this difficulty. But for some reason, maybe these are topics I'm not as strong at. Again, this is a metaphor. You know, maybe these are my weaker topics at, you know, slightly easier difficulty than my score should be. But I miss them and I end up at a, you know, end up at a 39 when my ability is a 43. So you don't want to intentionally kneecap yourself. Uh, but you can also recover from a few silly mistakes early. And that's true of the algorithm. There's a myth out there that, you know, the first seven questions, they determine your whole thing. Not really. That's a, that's a kind of a, a, it's a nuanced myth. We'll talk about why it's a myth and, and what's really going on. So just some interesting comparisons. Use, you know, if we think about this algorithm and how this test is graded, how this football score was graded, right? Here are two scores, a 44 and a 39. 44 is better. Only two misses left. Only two more misses for the 39, not a lot. Same ability, same test taker, quote unquote. But because of the algorithms, you know, the, the luck of the draw on the algorithm, I ended up with a different score. So you, can, you don't have, you're not going to get the same score every time, even if you're capable of it. There's a range of probabilities that you can end up at. The test is making its best guess for where you are. Sometimes you might be a little better. Sometimes you might be a little worse. Okay, here are two identical scores using this algorithm style, two 39s, seven more questions missed here. It's not the number of questions missed that determined the 39. This is one where it gave me the, you know, all these 50s, who cares? Miss all the 50s you want, same score, okay? Same number missed, slightly different scores, 11 failures, three points higher for the 42. Here's a fun one five more questions missed, higher score. And again, this is not an exact replica of the GMAT algorithm. This was one where the 50s were spitting out too much, but point is, it's not the number missed. It's not how many times you miss a question that determines the score you get. It's not really the game. Now the GMAT is much more algorithmic. It's much better at making sure everyone misses about the same number. I was just kind of winging it here. But you can end up with very different results uh, with very different, uh, with, with very similar number missed. Okay, here's a 44 and 20, 16 failures each. You, you grade a test this way and you get, you know, wildly different outcomes with similar numbers missed. Here's a simulation. So let's, so that's the, that's the gist of how this works. Let's do talk about, okay, that's how the test works for determining your score but what if you know you can't do higher than 51 51 yards 
And let's say I'm, you know, really consistent at 51. Notice this test taker only missed six. What score do they get? Well, they get a 51. Why do they get a 51? Well, they have a 75% chance of getting 51 yards. This is a very good thrower. And so they get a bunch of 51s. They only miss six at the end of the day. Okay. Now, does that mean that the algorithm switches to counting how many you get wrong? Kind of, but kind of not. It's really just that this person beats the algorithm. This person just doesn't give the algorithm enough chances to miss. The algorithm doesn't have hard enough yardages to, to give this person. If it did, it would. If, if, if the algorithm had higher yardages to give, it would do that, and the game would be the same as ever. It's just that this person is better than the max of the algorithm. And so that's what happens when you get to those higher scores. You do end up missing fewer questions. So it does look like fewer questions gets a higher score, or fewer misses gets a higher score. But the reason the person is missing fewer questions is because they're actually better than the test is. They've beaten the test. Good for them. It doesn't really change your strategy. You're still getting the questions you're capable of getting and not making silly mistakes, you know, as, as few as you can. This was a 50, this was a, someone who had an ability of 51 who had a, a bad day missed some questions similar as we saw before, right? Just had some times where probably should have gotten the question right, but missed it. You know, the odds were in their favor, but you know, they just missed a few and they ended up at a 49 when they really had a capability of a 51. That happens. Okay, I didn't do any silly mistakes here. It's just the odds were not in your favor and that's gonna happen. Sometimes you can not make silly mistakes, but it's just topics are not your strength and you don't get the score you're really capable of. Here was someone who uh, had a 51 and got a 51, missed 11 questions, and their, their ability was actually a 51. That's their 50% mark. So notice they missed more than the six we saw before. We had someone who missed six and someone who missed 11. Well, they both get the same score because the person who missed six is really should score higher than a 51. There's not a higher score to get. So they get a 51. Uh, this person missed 11 because 51 is their score. That's their 50% mark. And so they ended up at their 50% mark, which is what the test is basically trying to do. Figure out where you go from likely to get to likely to miss. So just that's, we're done with that simulation, but that's just to really get an intuitive feeling for what's going on in this algorithm and how it's not just counting up, okay, rights and wrongs and subtract the wrongs and that's your score. It's giving you easy questions and harder questions and easier yardages and harder yardages and trying to figure out where you are consistent over time. And your performance, you know, every time you perform, it gets more data to figure out where that point is. And it hones in narrower and narrower as it gets more data on you as a test taker. Okay, so just some, some close enough approximations for how this algorithm works. Number correct is not the game. Everyone misses about the same number on a question, most everyone, except for those people who've beaten the game and they're scoring, you know, they're just beating the algorithm. No question is weighted more than others. Every question is worth the same. Early questions do not matter more. Once the basket is in place, every question is weighted the exact same. It's close enough approximation to say that the ceiling of your score is determined by the easier questions you miss, and the floor of your score is determined by the harder questions you get right, the harder questions you earn. You know, that'll keep your score from absolutely bottoming, bottoming out, but that's usually not what people are worried about. <laughs> people are usually worried about hitting their ceiling. And you don't want to set your ceiling too low by making silly mistakes. Score killers, easier misses. There's questions you shouldn't miss. If you miss a lot of questions in a row, because you're probably rushing and you're frantic and you miss questions you shouldn't miss. Leaving questions blank because that doesn't give you a chance to get questions you should get. No, Bianca, the last questions are not weighted more. Every question is weighted the same. Once the basket is set, every question gets the same amount.
again, it's close enough. It's not exactly accurate, but it's close enough to say that when you get a question right, you get a harder question and you get a question wrong, you get an easier question. That's, hard. that's close enough to say it's not exactly right, but it's how you can think of it. The score does get lower if you miss the last question, Bianca, but that's not because the last questions are weighted more. It's just because you're missing questions. Your score gets lower if you miss questions early too. You just have a chance to recover. That is, a, that is the bummer about the end. You know, if you make silly questions, misses at the end, there's no chance to recover from them and show like, no, no, those were silly. But that doesn't mean the scores themselves are weighted more. And it's also important to know that there's luck in play. Some days are better than others. You know, you get score, you get questions that play to your strengths or that play to your weaknesses. You know, just using the algorithm, I showed you a few times where, you know, the score was lower than the ability level. And that was just the odds. It wasn't, that was just pure math. The odds weren't, they didn't happen that time. You know, difficulties that should have been 70% correct were actually like 50% correct. And so the score was lower than it should have been. That just happens. Now some nuance to those generalities. As we said before, at higher, when you're scoring higher, there's no harder questions to give. So it starts to look like the number correct matters. But that's really just because they've beaten the game. Early questions do set a trajectory. You know, if you make five silly mistakes in the first 10 questions, yeah, the test has you on a trajectory for a lower score. But you can recover from a few silly mistakes. But notice if you keep making silly mistakes, I mean, they are, they could be silly mistakes, but it's a, you have a bad habit that's causing you to miss questions you shouldn't miss. And part of the test is how often do you miss questions you shouldn't miss? Here's a little fact at the end of the test, at the end of a section, the algorithm looks at all the questions you answered and it finds the one or two easiest and the one or two hardest and it discounts them. So I, I should say this, they're actually, some questions are weighted a little less, the one or two easiest and the one or two hardest. Whether you got them right or wrong, the test just treats those as outliers and weights them a little bit less than the rest of the test. Also a good reason not to worry about that really hard question that pops up because it might end up being one of the hardest ones you see, it's gonna be discounted anyway. This, it's also not true, you know, sometimes you don't get a harder question when you get a question right. And sometimes you don't get an easier question when you get a question wrong. That is close enough, but that's not quite how the algorithm works. Okay. The same performance on the same basket of questions results in the same outcome. So all of these situations, I changed the order around but all of them have a right answer to A, a wrong answer to B, a right answer to C, a right answer to D, wrong to E, wrong to F, right to G. Just done in different orders. All of those outcomes, identical. If the test were eight questions long, I didn't wanna to have to write 31 questions every time. So once the section is over, every question again, except for the one or two easiest is weighted the same. The same performance on the same questions results in the same score. The question is, do you, you know, do you get the same questions, right? Because each question you get next is determined by the performance on the questions you've already seen. So as you're going through the test, the test is getting more data about who it thinks you are as a test taker and it determines what question to give you next based on that. And then you answer that and it gets more data on you and it gives you a question based on that. Trying to find that, where do we go from consistent to inconsistent? Trying to find that level, okay? That's probably enough for what you would need to know to study for this test. But for the sake of fun, we're gonna get into the nitty gritty here. Talk about what's called the item characteristic curves. I call them S curves. Every question on the test has an item characteristic curve or an S curve. Before we introduce the S curve though, let me show you what the perfect GMAT question would look like if it existed. Every GMAT question wants to discriminate 
a tester into above or below a certain score. Okay, if we could make the perfect GMAT question, it would look like this. And everyone scoring below a certain score had a 20% chance of getting that question right because it's blind guessing. And everyone at that score or above would get 100% right. They're guaranteed to get it. So if I give this question and this person gets it right, I am 100% certain that they should score above a 38. I guess it's not quite right, but I'm pretty sure they should be above a 38. So there's a 20% chance that they should be, that they actually just got lucky, you know? So it's not exactly right, but basically it's, you know, if, 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 this if this question is perfect and someone gets it right, it's likely that they are above a 38. Maybe they got lucky. So I give, you know, I'll see, I'll give them another question at this difficulty. And if they get it right again, okay, I'm pretty sure. And if they get it right again and again, the odds of someone guessing right four times in a row, if they're guessing, is very low. One in five, one in 25, one in 125, one in 625, you know? So I could give four questions at this difficulty if it was a perfect question. And if they get it right three or four times, I know that, you know, I'm almost certain that they are above a 38. But of course, no question like this exists. There's nothing that perfect. What happens instead is an S-curve. And so every question has this S curve. And so, yeah, if you're scoring, if, you, if the question is meant to discriminate around a 38, if you're scoring an eight or a nine, it's basically 20% chance you're guessing. But as people get better, they get a slightly better chance of getting this question right until, you know, the, 50, the 38 score is about 50% chance of getting this question right. And then, you know, they start to get 95, 99% chance of getting this question right. No, it's, you know, someone makes a silly mistake at some point always. So there's always a slight chance of missing and never quite gets to 100. But basically, people who score above a 38 are very likely to get this right. And people who score a lot less than a 38 are very likely to get this wrong. And every question on the test has a curve like this. It's called the item characteristic curve. Okay. The steeper that line, the better that question is at discriminating a certain score. If it's a flat line like this, that's you know not as useful. If it's a medium steep line, or if it's a you know if it's a if I can get a I'm sorry this is a medium so flat medium steep, and then if it's really steep, that's a useful question. That's a really good question that you know tells me if I'm over here or over here, if I answer right or wrong, where I probably am on that curve. So steepness tells you how well that question discriminates above and below a score. Where the curve is tells you how easy it is. An easier question, the steep part happens at lower scores, right? At this point, you know, someone scoring a 37 or above has basically 100% chance of getting this question right, 90 to 100% chance. That's an easier question. Still a guessing rate for someone scoring a six, but once you get to, you know, the 30, where that's a 50% mark, and then much above that, you, everyone's getting it right. An average question is, you know, has a middle score as the separator, and a hard question, the steep part, is at the end of a question. Most people miss the thing until about a 45, and it starts to tick up. And then, yeah, if you're 50, you have a really good chance. 51, you have a really good chance. But notice that below that score, there's a lot of people who have low chance of getting that question right. That's a hard question. And this is the one where it's like, who cares? Miss it. Doesn't hurt your score. Just a little tidbit about this. You know, how do they determine this S-curve? They give the question to a boatload of people in the experimental section of the test. Don't forget that every time you take an official test, some of the questions don't actually count for your score. They don't tell you which ones. They just are getting data for that question. They're determining what the S-curve is for that question. Figuring out, okay, you know, where people, if a person scores this, what is their chance of getting this question right? So they look at all the people who score a 38 and they determined, you know, okay, well, if you're scoring a 38, you have a 25% chance of getting this question right. And if you're scoring a 49, you have a 98% chance of getting this question right. Okay, so they gather that data from thousands of test takers before they give it on a test where it actually counts.
Uh, on, on the quant, three questions are experimental. On the verbal, six are experimental. Okay. Some things that are, just so you know, some things that are not allowed. The, the curve can never slope downward. It should never be that people who score higher on the test overall have a better chance of missing a question. If an if a experimental question results in an S-curve like this, they throw that question out. It's considered not fair. Right. If you're scoring a 20, you should not have a lower chance of getting it right than if you're scoring a seven. So it should always be upward sloping, even if it's very flat. It should always be upward sloping, no downward slope allowed. And so what is actually happening on the test when we say the test is adaptive? The test looks at the information it has about you and it determines what question to give you next. And it's going to put you somewhere on that S curve based on what it thinks your score is. So if I give a question like this and the test thinks that I'm testing a 32, that's its estimate for me at this question. Well, people who score 32 have a 37% chance of getting this question right. And so this test is, is, the test is not that surprised if I miss this question. It doesn't really hurt my score that much to miss this question. I kind of expect it. Conversely, if the test thinks I'm scoring a 45, it puts me at this location on this S curve. It says I have a 90% chance of getting this question right. Again, I'm just making up these numbers. So the test really thinks I'm gonna get this question right because people who are at my estimated score tend to get this question right. If I don't, that dings my score a little bit more. The test is surprised. Well, hold up, people who score 45, you know, 90% of them get this question right. Either I'm, you know, it was bad luck, I'm in the 10% that miss it, and I still get a 45, or more likely, I shouldn't get a 45. So it drops my score down a little bit. It just adds that data point to the set. And it does this again and again and again. Each time getting data and adjusting its expectation for who I am as a test taker. Now, if this is the S curve of a question and this is the chance of getting it right, I can make the inverse S curve, which is the chance of getting it wrong, which is just the, you know, adding to 100 from the chance of getting it right. So from 20, I go to 80. Here at the 50, it's about 50, you know, 40 and 60. And that gets me the, what's it, what's it, what we call the inverse S curve, which is the chance of getting it wrong at each score. So that will look like this. And what's happening at the end of the day, what the test does is it takes all the S curves of my right answers and all the inverse S curves of my wrong answers. And it combines them together and it gives me an estimated score based on that data. This is just three questions because again, I didn't want to draw 31, but it just it synthesizes all this data from here are the ones we got right, here's the ones we got wrong. It we say multiplies them together, but that's an abstract form of multiplication. It's not like arithmetic multiplication. It multiplies them together into an expected score. And it's, it's doing this throughout, that's what it does at the end. It's also doing an expected score at each question in the test. At each question in the test, the algorithm has a bell curve for what it thinks my score is. You know, it's it pretty sure my score is at the highest peak of this bell curve. And what the test does, and this is again, this is like six and seven, and over here is 49 and 50, 51. And right now the test thinks I'm a 38. You know, it's pretty sure I'm a 38. There's a chance I'm here. There's a chance I'm a little bit, you know, a little bit more, a little bit less, probably not a 51, probably not a six, right? It's pretty sure I'm around a 38. So what it wants to do is give me a, a question that discriminates at about that score. It tries to find a question whose S curve fits right in that range to help determine, okay, should I be a little bit more than 38 or a little less than 38? 
Am I actually a 38 or am I a little bit more or less? If a question is much easier, the, the test expects me to get it right. If I miss it, it gives it a pretty significant ding because it's it expects me to get this right. That S curve is easier than the score I'm at. Conversely, if an S curve, or here's the inverse S curve of that, right? It's I shouldn't miss this. But if it's an S curve that's a little bit more than my score, the test is not that surprised. It doesn't ding my score that much to miss that question. Ideally, it wants to give me one right there in the middle. So what's happening as the test goes on? Question one pops up. Here's the S curve for question one. I get it right. The test then makes a, an estimation. It's a very flat bell curve because they don't have a lot of data yet. They make an estimation. They say, okay, well, probably this is the score. Let's say it's a, a 40. And the quest, first question they give is about an average difficulty question, right? It's meant to separate kind of right in the middle of the section. And so I get it right and the test gives me a four, it, it expects me to be a 40, okay? Then they give me question two, a little bit harder, right? S curve's a little bit further right. Uh, again, I'm not an artist, so this kind of looks gross, but uh, it's a little bit further right. And let's say I also get that question right. So then the test makes an adjustment. It makes a new, a new range. And notice it's a little bit squished. It's a, like the high, the peak is a little bit more certain. We go from this height to this height because it's a little more certain that I'm there because it has two pieces of data now. And because I got the question right, it's moved the score to the right. So now I'm here. And here's question three, trying to discriminate at that score. And I miss question three. So the score is gonna move a little bit to the left, but again, get a little bit higher. And I might not have drawn that right, but pretend that that, that hump is a little bit higher because it has a little more data than it did before. Yeah, definitely lower. <laughs> make this do a quick in in class edit let's put this just a little bit higher so it's a little bit higher than it is at at the second question and it moves that hump to there okay but then let's say i miss question four i'm going to not draw the escrows anymore so it moves the hump to here a little bit higher because it has a little more data. So here's after question four. Then after question five, that's probably too extreme, but it gets a little bit higher. It's a little more certain because it has more data. And this is what's happening throughout the whole test. Every, you know, question 10, it's a little more certain. At question 18, it's a little more certain. And at the end of the test, this is the distribution. It's pretty sure that, I, that, that that's my score whatever this, you know, call this a 38, let's say I am a 38. It's determined with some likelihood that I am a 38. And that's what's happening. We're going, the, the prediction of our score gets, it starts kind of long and flat because it doesn't have a lot of data. And as you get questions right, the peak moves right or left, depending on if you're getting questions right or wrong. And the peak gets higher as the test gets more certain. And again, I'm not an artist, this is a pretty terrible demonstration, but it gets the point across. And so note that this is the test's best guess, you know, based on the data of that day. But as we've already seen, there is some luck in play. And in fact, the standard deviation of the 200 to 800 point score is 30. What that means is there's a basically a 67% chance that you're plus or minus, that you're within 30 points of your actual score or what your actual ability is. You know, so if your actual ability is a 620 and you end up getting a 640, okay, it's a little bit higher, but that's within the, the expected range, right? Plus or minus 30. But notice that that is only 67%, right? It's actually not unlikely that you get a score more than 30 above what uh, that you sh that your your actual ability is more than 30 than what the test gave or less than 30 than what the test gave. So whenever students come in, I was like, ah, why did my score drop 30 points? Well, it really didn't. 30 points is not, you know, that's that's totally within the standard deviation. You're not always going to get the exact same score and it's not always going to rise because it's a lot of there's a lot of noise in the data. 
But based on those questions, based on that basket of questions and your performance on them, this is their expectation for, you know, for what's, or I guess this is your expectation with this amount of certainty for what your score is. And that's what the algorithm's doing. Mike, yeah, 38.42 is about the same. Again, it might be plus or minus 10 points, but it's basically additive. You might not have been here for the beginning lesson there. Okay. So what are the biggest takeaways of this algorithm, of, of really getting into what this algorithm is? For one, there's no gaming it. There's no like trying to, you know, get the first 10 right, and then you're going to get a great score. Uh, if you get the first 10 right, you're capable of getting a great score, unless you spend too much time and then your score plummets, right? But if you can get the first 10 questions right, yeah, sure, do that. I can't, I don't think, <laughs> you know, like um, there's no gaming this. You just take the question in front of you and you do your best. You're going to miss questions guaranteed. You really, your work is on minimizing questions you shouldn't miss. Have the habits and the strategies and the timing discipline to not miss questions you shouldn't miss. Because if you do that, your score just takes a hit. You do it more than twice, three times, four times, five times. Now your score is really taking a hit. Uh, and, and that's your primary focus when you're taking a section. You know, you're going to miss a boatload. Who cares? But the ones that you shouldn't miss, don't miss them. Because those are the ones that put the score, push the score most. Okay. And those easy, you know, those, those mistakes, easy misses hurt higher scores more. The more extreme outside of, uh, outside of that expected, that expected range, where's that? So, you know, if this is my estimated score, missing a question that looks like this affects that score more than if the expected score looked like this, right? It really dings this score that's higher because the test really thought you should get this question right. Similarly, who cares about missing this question? That doesn't affect a score that much. It'll push it a little bit to the left, but not much. Not enough to matter. Okay. So, um, how should you approach if you're scoring on the higher end of CAT to name for 750 plus? You just can't afford to miss many questions with your dash. I mean, that's here's the thing, Mike. You know, at, at, when you're scoring above a 750, you're not aiming to miss fewer questions. You just don't miss as many questions naturally. It's not. It's not the result of your intent. You can't shit, you know, you can't like be like, okay, now I can only miss four questions this time. Now I can only miss three questions this time. It's just, you have to get better so that you just have a better chance of getting the questions at that difficulty, right? You can only ever, like the thing about this, the message here is you can only ever take the question in front of you. You can, you know, invest your time and energy as you choose and get it right or wrong. And then you have to move on. There's no there's no trying to get a question right or you know, try to get fewer questions right. It's just, what's the question in front of me? Can I do it or not? And the ones that pop up that I really feel like I can get, doesn't matter if I'm scoring a 500 or a 750. If a question pops up and I feel like I can get it, I need to slow down and get it and, you know, get those points. If a question pops up and it makes, it looks like a hellish nightmare, I can maybe poke at it for a second, see if I figure anything out. Otherwise, bail. It's not going to, you know, there's no doing it. You can't will yourself to do a question that you otherwise couldn't do this is not how it works okay paul has you know is there any like topic of question that the algorithm skews difficult i think the answer to that question for all intents and purposes paul is no for every topic they have questions that are easy medium and difficult having said that things like combinatorics and probability those you know if it's a hard version of those, it's a hard question. Okay. I'll stick around now to answer any questions from the crowd. If you're looking for upcoming courses, check out that link, manhattanprep.com slash gmat slash classes. Again, you can attend a free course for free. A first, a first class for free and our foundation of math course. Um, I hope this gave you more information than you ever needed for knowing how the algorithm works. Um, and I hope you understand better what your approach should be 
uh, to score highly on this test because it's just not about the number of questions right. Okay. I will see you all at the next free GMAT prep hour. If you have any suggestions or topics, please shoot me an email. Uh, have a happy holidays and I'll see you all soon.